Okay, thanks. Um, hi, good afternoon again. <laughs> Uh, my name is Venetia Lannan. I'll be the moderator of this panel uh, called Pulling Back the Curtain, uh, talking about public act, the, the balancing the needs b between public access and education and the working waterfront. And I'll give you the, the bios of the panelists in one moment. Um, but maybe while I'm waiting, I'll just say a sort of a word of introduction about, about myself and why I'm doing double duty on the, on the panels this afternoon. So in my, in my current job, as I said in the last panel, I'm the regional director for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, DEC, your environmental regulator in Region 2, New York City. In my last job, I ran the Maritime Division at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, EDC. And um, in that capacity, we worked at EDC to promote the needs of the working waterfront and to promote the needs of the maritime industry. And one of the things that I came to learn about the maritime industry and quite frankly, I went to go and work to D at DEC motivated by the needs of the maritime industry and try to improve the, the regulatory uh, process for, for the maritime industry, amongst other reasons. But one of the things that I learned when I worked at EDC is that the, ma the working waterfront, the marita maritime in in industry in New York City, we all know how critical, how vital it is, the number of jobs, the cargo. We've heard the statistics many, many times. But one of the things that I learned is that this is an industry that is very quiet. They're very quiet in terms of the way they move things on the water seamlessly and bring us the goods and services that Roland told you about that we all completely take for granted every day. But they're also quiet um, as people. They don't tend to promote themselves. And they don't, um, I would say, compared to other industries, like if you want to think about the real estate industry or the financial industry in New York City, they don't, they don't make a lot of noise politically. They don't advocate for themselves. And um, there are obviously very important groups uh, like the Maritime Association and the work that Ed Kelly does. And I don't want to in any way say that it's not effective, but I would say as an industry, it's quiet in New York City. And I think that in some ways, this is, it's sort of a double-edged sword for the industry because you know, the, the downside of that is that, that people don't often know what the needs are of the maritime industry. Um, the importance of, why, of dredging and having a sound dredging policy, the importance of regulatory reform and predictability, the importance of having places on the waterfront that are not open to the public. Um, a lot of people don't understand these things because the, the industry doesn't make a lot of noise about itself. I've come to learn also as a regulator um, that the maritime industry is quiet because they want to keep doing what they're doing and they don't want people to bother them. Um, I'm, I'm seeing some nods here. I'm hoping that I, we ha I know we have some reps here from the maritime industry and I hope they'll chime in and um, participate in this conversation. Um, so when you think about public access and, and the working waterfront, it's also, it, it feeds into that kind of dichotomy in that again, a double-edged sword. Unless people can see what's going on in, in the working waterfront, unless they can really get behind the, the, the barricades and walls to watch the process, they don't become advocates and they don't understand the importance of the maritime industry and they don't go to their elected officials and say, hey, scrap metal, is, it's really important to me that it moves by barge. Um, but on, on the other hand, these are, these are gritty, dangerous businesses with a lot of moving parts and pieces, heavy equipment, ropes. Um, it's, it's not a place that really the public should be going. Um, and after uh, September 11th, it's a place that the Department of Homeland Security has cordoned off places and say you can't go, certain port facilities. So I think it's a really interesting challenge to have a, a waterfront community that engages locally, that is, they're obviously important employers, um, that gains advocates in their backyards, but keeps what it needs, which is a certain degree of, um, certainly they need security, but they need a certain degree of privacy, quite frankly, to get on and do what they're doing. Um, so I'm looking forward to this panel with both of my hats on and uh, will now um, tell you about our panelists. And I'm not going to give them to you in the order <laughs> that they're sitting next to me because I don't have them that way, so forgive me. But maybe if you could just raise your hand as I speak about you. I'm going to start with Sharon Henry. 
Um, is Sharon Henry is a principal of Ralph McKee um, Career and Technical Education High School. And um, this is, you may have heard in Council Member Debbie Rose's presentation at lunchtime that um, McKee uh, Technical High School on Staten Island is working with the city, with the Economic Development Corporation and others to put together a vocational training program geared towards uh, the, the maritime industry. And I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, Andrew Kimball from Jamestown Properties is uh, National Director of Innovation Economy and Initiatives and also CEO of Industry City. Where did we just pass it? No, we're not there yet. Coming. Yep. I'm sort of disoriented. We, we passed Industry City at one point. It's coming up. Coming up. Um, and before that, Andrew was at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, so he knows from his working waterfront, uh, as well as getting the public to the waterfront. Um, Bear with me here, Thomas Outerbridge. Thomas Outerbridge um, is the general manager for Sims Municipal Recycling. And I think we're gonna pause and point out Sims facility when we pass it. Many of you may have heard, they are the, the company that recycles the city's metal glass and plastic and a portion of its paper in the municipal curbside program and has developed a state of the art uh, recycling facility um, on the Sunset Park Brooklyn waterfront. And also has developed a great education center, which I'm hoping we'll hear about. Um, we have Jim Pinn. And Jim Pinn is the plant superintendent at New York City Department of Environmental Protection's largest and most technically advanced wastewater treatment plant, plant at Newtown Creek. I think plant superintendent doesn't do justice to what, what Jim does. <laughs> I think he is one of the greatest educators uh, that DEP has, and I would encourage everyone to take a tour of the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant. Um, Open House New York runs tours, as does DEP. I took my mother th mother-in-law there. It was a very memorable mother-in-law daughter tour. I kissed her. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and then, um, oh, hang on. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I don't have these in order. Uh, last but not least, hang on, hang on. Pete Dirk is global leader for water management and leads the global knowledge network for flood protection and water management for Arcadis worldwide. Did I hit everyone? Yeah, okay. So um, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists um, to talk about how they deal with attention um, in, in their respective facilities and lives and, and, and dealings with getting the public to the waterfront and protecting the working waterfront. Okay. Give it a start. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about an example from, uh, from Rotterdam, from the Netherlands. Um, it was already also mentioned uh, earlier by uh, Jean Dupont from uh, the the Rockaways uh, on a trip uh, that she visited Rotterdam with the community leaders from uh, New York and can you hear me right up to my mouse okay so talking about uh, the example of Rotterdam the so-called RDM campus um, an old industrial area a waterfront an old port area comparable to the the sites that we see right here on the on the Brooklyn side um, where the old port activities were abandoned and the whole area was more or less uh, abandoned and in decay. And then the Port Authority, together with the Rotterdam, City of Rotterdam and the Rotterdam University, and I was at that time a part-time professor there, decided to redevelop that place and change the RDM, which was a, an old uh, dock, into a research design and manufacturing area where uh, the access to the waterfront is not only a matter of public access where you can walk to the waterfront, but much more than that, it is engaging the community, the local community, by uh, let them benefit from the development in that waterfront. So by redeveloping this industrial waterfront with new education opportunities and with innovative industries, making the access not only to the waterfront, but also to the activities that are there with, for instance, um, new public transport over water, new green areas, but also new public areas that they, they can benefit from and also can participate in. At the RDM campus, you will find now education from every level, from PhD level down to vocational uh, level. Um, people not only design great things, but also make them really work. So it's a making industry waterfront 
uh, really related to the old port activities uh, that we had uh, there. And we had a lot of visitors um, from the US that came over there that were really excited and said, this is an interesting example. We could share that knowledge with Rotterdam and maybe use it in New York. We started in 2010. In fact, many of the people on the boat here were involved in that. Chris Ward was uh, one of our big advocates. He really started this. Uh, we had Dan Wiley and Congresswoman Velasquez. Um, Angela Licata, who was also here today, was also... Yeah? Hey, you were there. I see was there as well. So many of the people here were already there. And uh, the idea was born of the so-called Brooklyn Rotterdam Waterfront Exchange. I'm not going into details. We had a couple of years of uh, knowledge exchange. But what really came out of that is a, a very strong cooperation now between the Rotterdam University, this RDM campus, and Pratt Institute. We had a fantastic delegation there by March 20 coming over, um, learning about the waterfront, but also much more emphasizing the importance of community resiliency and community leadership. The community leaders came in from Red Hook, from uh, the Rockaways, from the Lower East Side, and I have to tell you honestly, they impressed the Dutch by showing much more community leadership than we are used to in the Netherlands. So you really have an asset there in New York that uh, we can learn a lot from. But we came up with the idea of having a, uh, uh, an MOU between Pratt and the Rotterdam people. Columbia University is going to join that effort, so it's a wonderful result of this cooperation. And we will continue to exchange knowledge, um, learn from each other, but in particular see how you can create this new way of looking at access to the waterfront for the community by engaging that community, let it benefit from the development and use education as a very important uh, tool in that. I want to leave it there. Perfect. Thanks so much. And maybe after each speaker, I'll just sort of pull, pull, pull out some of the, the tension. So when we went on to Rotterdam and we saw their old port, and as we're passing by all these old storage facilities from, you know, uh, uh, warehouses and maritime industries from dating back to the Civil War, you know, when these buildings go to be repurposed, how can they be repurposed in ways that are authentic to the working waterfront if they can't be used for working waterfront themselves? So, you know, IKEA was very controversial. It took a graving dock and, you know, other than the cranes, really has nothing to do with the working waterfront, either its past, present, or, or, or future. Um, so the idea was how do we look at, you know, this whole stretch of waterfront and think about re-envisioning it as, a, as either educational opportunities or working opportunities that's in, that in some way relate to the working waterfront. And Chris Ward really deserves, I think, a lot of credit for that exchange. Um, okay, Sharon Henry. Good afternoon. Sorry if I seem a little loud. I've got my principal's voice on. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction and for being invited to this wonderful panel. Here are the facts. McKee Career and Technical High School is about college, career, and life. I have 630 students. 30.9% of my students are special education. One out of three students which means they read below reading level. If the student is interested in our programs, we take them. Next, I have 102 staff members, 49 of which are teachers, and it opened officially in 1935. That's tension. Now, how do we do what we do? How do we have a young man in 2014 who's now the top runner in New York City? How do we have in 2012 New York City Regional Champions in, in Robo Wizards. How are we in 2013 the top desktop publishing web design school? How does that happen? One, I nag. Two, <laughs> the next piece is that I'm just gonna share three short little stories about the type of collaboration that it takes. Right now as we speak, and I enjoy this beautiful view. I have 35 students who are in Skills USA in Syracuse, New York, who are demonstrating their mastery and proficiency in the six areas. The six areas are electrical engineering installation, it's construction, it's graphic arts, it's also automotive. One of the areas that was very prevalent but is now moving towards something else was cosmetology because we are bringing in software engineering and design. And the last piece also deals with the fact that we have AutoCAD or architecture. 
Next, in those stories, those students spent hours after school, untold hours. I cannot pay the teachers for the number of hours that they spent training, going through what it is that they love and they do and identifying that passion and then having teachers reach out to different business partners that help mentor the students to help them practice and perfect what it is that they know. Second story, I have a wonderful program called Advancement Via Individual Determination. That's called AVID. Now, AVID was something that was created by Bill and Melinda Gates, it was initially funded about five years ago, and it's a way to help students who struggle with reading and literacy and writing to help them college and career ready. In order for that piece to happen, that requires dedicated teachers who go to training, participate in that training, follow the students, track them as they go through their different classes, and make sure that at the end of the four years, they are aligned with a two or four year college because every child needs to have the option of post-secondary skills every CTE school. So when you said vocational, and you said all the way down to vocational, you're a wonderful, wonderful man, but that's part of the, no, 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 you're a wonderful, wonderful man, and we have to make sure that as part of the culture of change that we continue to push that. Uh, up to vocational, how about? Yeah, up to vocational, that's cool. And more importantly, that it's all part of the technical education process. Next, we have 40 internships. When I started at McKee in 2007, we had one. That requires a lot of push and a lot of cold calling. And through Mr. Kimball's organization, particularly Andrew Genn and Councilwoman Debbie Rose and Borough President Otto, I cannot begin to tell you how that helps to make an inroad. One last little short, 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 mini, mini story. So. Throw your mind back to 2012. We're trying, we're pushing like mad to try to get the maritime organizations to come to our school on Staten Island, which is only three blocks from the ferry, to say, we're a natural match. We're right here near the ferry. We would be perfect for you to start a pilot program dealing with maritime skills and careers and opportunities. They said, mm, because as Ms. Vanessa said, because I can't remember her last name for some reason, Ms. Vanessa said it is a gritty industry, but it's also a marvelous industry. And what happened is that, don't you know, Hurricane Sandy hits, ships are on shore, the island is devastated. Now, fast forward to June, all of a sudden we, through a pure set of circumstances, one of the students, that happened to be invited to a particular event, talks to his mother, and the mother says, I'm gonna call that principal. She calls me up and says, you don't know me, but you will. I said, okay, because you know, you don't know when a parent calls, how the conversation can turn. So I'm going for a positive, okay, we can do this. And she says the following, you created an opportunity for my child to actually listen and hear something that he normally would not have heard. So therefore, what I want to do is I want to create opportunities for your children to come on board to Miller's launch and start working. I said, really? Let me tell you, if you say it, it's going to be so. I got my work-based learning coordinator on it. I notified Andrew again. I notified Councilman Rose. I notified everybody just emailed everybody. And I said, this is an opportunity. This is a chance. Once they get it, they'll love it. And now, two years later, they have created this wonderful opportunity where our kids now have actual real life work experience that they now see the connection between math and academics, see the connection between what they're learning in auto and construction and in Cisco in order to be able to see all the different areas that working a boat and working a shipyard connects. I say all this to say reaching out to a, skill, to a school requires so many different areas of integration and collaboration and requires business people being able to just say, I think I'll give that school a chance. Thank you so much.
quick quick commercial break here. Uh, this is the Sims material reco recovery facility that we're looking at, materials recovery facility. Um, and we're just passing Industry City is that row of buildings in the back there and the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal is in the foreground. Um, I, st I will admit I still don't know my port from starboard, Andrew Gen. Still don't know it. Over there. <laughs> I, know, I always get it wrong. Um, I just, uh, just a very super quick anecdote before we move on to Andrew Kimball and timely we're looking at Industry City, his vast empire behind us. Um, that when, and Andrew again really deserves so much credit for this um, program, put, trying to connect the maritime industry with, with McGee Technical High School. And there was a, uh, a shipyard um, owner on Staten Island, or general manager rather, who shall remain nameless, who told me that he had a, a marine electrical engineer who was no exaggeration, I think in his 80s, but he wouldn't let him retire because there was no one to take his place. You know, meanwhile, the unemployment that we have on Staten Island and the job challenges that are facing these students, it's just a natural connection to try to get these kids into the maritime industry. And I think everyone really deserves a lot of credit for, for a really innovative program. So we'll turn it over to Andrew Kimball and uh, Industry City. Uh, thank you, Venetia. Let me, let me just start by uh, congratulating and thanking Principal Henry. I think the work she's doing is extraordinary in terms of connecting, making vocational links to industries that are growing uh, in New York. Um, also, Andrew Gen, who's done a lot of amazing work on the waterfront for years here in New York, and my, my brother from a different mother, Kyle Kimball, at the EDC, um, <laughs> who I think is going to be a fantastic leader. Um, we are uniquely positioned here on the boat's uh, port side um, to look out and see Industry City. Um, it's a 30-acre property, uh, 16 buildings, 6 million square feet of space, uh, all privately owned. Um, that contrasts with the Brooklyn Navy Yard where I spent the last eight years up until last August, um, 300 acres, 45 buildings, uh, city-owned land, uh, a public-private partnership. Um, so some real differences between the two, uh, but similarities, there are many. And a lot of that has to do with um, creating good paying, sustainable jobs, uh, what I like to call the innovation economy, which is a sort of new definition of what manufacturing looks like today. And it's really the broad range of making a physical, a digital, or an engineered product um, in industrial parks on the waterfront that often have um, collaborations with maritime industrial activity. Certainly we did uh, at the Navy Yard with several large uh, maritime industrial outfits. Uh, we hope to down here over time uh, with the fantastic Sims plant, which you'll hear about in a minute, and all the sustainability going on here, and with the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal over time, hopefully with the full activation of the rail uh, and the maritime uses there. We think there can be tremendous synergies in our building. So that's one parallel between the two sites. Uh, another is really creating educational linkages. Um, so at the Navy Yard, one of the very effective things we did was figure out ways to partner with local colleges and universities, starting with Pratt University that had a sustainability incubator where young folks who wanted to make things, and that is very popular again, it's very cool, uh, it's exploding in New York, could come and design, uh, start up their businesses in an incubator environment, and then hopefully graduate uh, into space at the Navy Yard. We did it through uh, a partnership with Steiner Studios and Brooklyn College that's creating the first graduate school of film uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And ultimately, it's going to happen, it looks like, uh, with Carnegie Mellon as well around digital media and technology research. Uh, we did it with the Harbor School uh, and, MWB and MWA uh, with a series of programs that gave access to the waterfront uh, around boat building and other maritime uh, experiences. Uh, another parallel between the two sites uh, are um, our interest and the effectiveness at drawing people back down to the waterfront. Not just for jobs, that's the primary focus, uh, but also to experience that waterfront in interesting ways. Uh, and we believe that you can have recreation and heavy industry and the innovation economy all mixed together in effective ways. And in many ways, while we didn't physically take down the walls of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, we metaphysically, we, we did. 
by allowing the public in for the first time, doing all sorts of tours, creating an exhibition and visitor center that told our story and encouraged young people to get into careers uh, in the various industrial sectors that are growing in New York, uh, including maritime. And that's something we'd like to do uh, at Industry City in a, in a very, very big way. Uh, it's an exciting project. In a lot of ways, I feel like um, to, to, to go with a maritime metaphor, I've, I've sort of stepped onto an aircraft carrier that was going in the wrong direction for 50 years, and we're trying to slowly turn it around. Um, so like a lot of other industrial waterfront properties that were privately owned, as traditional manufacturing began to shrink uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, continuing into the 90s, um, the easy thing to do, and in some cases the only thing to do, was to turn it into storage and warehouse. Very low employment uses, um, really closing off the waterfront in a lot of ways, not making it safe. There was really no incentive to invest in the buildings. That has begun to change over the last decade in New York, not just because of what's happening at the Navy Yard, but was because of what's happening at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, because of what's happening in the private sector with the Pfizer building, uh, 1000 Dean Street, where developers are recognizing that you can adaptively reuse these physical structures. This is where today's new maker wants to be in these cool old buildings on the waterfront. Increasingly, they want to be in Brooklyn and Queens to do it. Um, and they want to be around educational institutions. They also want to be next to a great local workforce. And we've got that here in Sunset Park. We had it down at the Navy Yard. Uh, and in many communities up and down the waterfront, there are those opportunities. So we're taking a complex that when uh, a new partnership came together, including the previous owners with new owners, recommitted to investing in the site. And we're currently putting in $100 million, taking what had been a complex that was 30% vacant 40% low employment warehouse distribution and turning it around into a innovation economy hub that will be 70% innovation economy jobs and we hope to go over the next 10 years from 2,400 to 15,000 jobs. 12% academic. We would love in one of those big beautiful buildings and there's one right on the waterfront that we just spent two million dollars on stabilizing. Um, it can't be occupied now because we had 50 million dollars of damage in Storm Sandy and 20 million gallons of water in our basements. We were basically the storm surge barrier for Sunset Park. Uh, but we'd love to find a partner over time that would convert one of those buildings uh, into an academic hub in sectors connected to those growing inside Industry City. So whether around engineering or technology or maritime, we'd love over time for there to be a high school embedded in that college or university so that you develop a pipeline of uh, workers, vocational skills, and also young entrepreneurs who will move into Industry City. And then about 12% of the space, maker retail. So there's an increasingly focus on sustainable products, local food chain, farm to table, and you can, in very small spaces, have small factories, particularly around food, but also wood and glass blowing and other sectors. And we're asking those folks on the ground floors in our building to have a retail outlet that draws people down from the buildings, people in from the community, and people from farther uh, into Industry City. So I'll stop there. That's great, and um, the nice contrast with sort of the new, the new, the new economy and the old economy. I don't know if you just saw the Buchanan barge that went by with all the aggregate in it. Andrew, how many trucks is that? <laughs> Roughly. A lot of trucks. <laughs> fifty-six. That's that's the equivalent of fifty-six trucks that just went by of aggregate. Maybe going to uh, New York Sand and Stone. Maybe, probably. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Tom Outerbridge from Sims. Good, uh, good afternoon. No one to hear me. Um, it's okay. No. You gotta really pull it right, literally up to your mouth. I was off. <laughs> we are, I guess, the quiet little industry that uh, Venetia was talking about. <laughs> um, and actually, that that's actually very accurate. I mean, uh, the company I work with, Sims Municipal Recycling, is a um, a division of Sims Metal Management, which is uh, got a big presence in the scrap metal business, and we operate in industrial corners of the, uh, whether it's Albany, Stamford, and in the New York metropolitan area, all of our facilities on the water, and we move millions of tons of material a year on the water, and certainly historically, no one particularly wanted to advertise what we do or draw attention to it. Um, 
with the opening of this facility in Sunset Park, that's really changed our whole, I say that, that reflects a, a sea change for us. And um, could ask why we did it. Um, and, uh, and actually that, the, you know, there's a very simple explanation for it in many ways, uh, because uh, on the in the curbside recycling program, the entire business hinges on participation by the public. If New Yorkers don't know about the recycling program or don't believe that it is actually, you know, the city's collecting the material that it's actually being recycled, um, and they don't bother separating the material at the, at the household level, uh, there's no business for us. There's no program. Um, so uh, to the extent that we could build a facility that had a high profile, that dr attracted attention, that, that uh, um, people wanted to visit other than maybe the uh, normal environmental community that always wants to visit these facilities, but a larger community, um, that, that could only help uh, the recycling program. Um, so the educational element in some ways is building the facility itself um, in a very prominent location. Um, we hired an architect. Um, and then being in the recycling business, we consider ourselves to be in the sustainability business um, inherently. And so we also wanted to build into that facility uh, other sustainable features that made sense for our location. Um, and that site. And actually the photograph that's on this edge brochure uh, shows a number of the things that, that the visitor would not normally see, including, actually I should say, that this project is uh, very much of a collaboration between Sims uh, and the City of New York. Uh, the Department of Sanitation has a, uh, we have a long-term contract with the Department of Sanitation, so we take 100% of the metal, glass, and plastic that the city collects from uh, New Yorkers. Um, and um, that material is really the basis, obviously, that's the foundation for building this facility. And we have a long-term lease with the Economic Development Corporation, which identified this pier for us, or for this use, and also through a funding agreement, the city paid for a significant amount of uh, infrastructure because the pier was not in a position or in a condition that we could build on it. Um, Tom, can you say a word about how you guys rely on the water to, to move the recyclables? Right, so the selection of the site was tied very much to its waterfront location. We move everything, 100% uh, of our intra-company movements are on the water. So we receive material in the Bronx, on the Bronx River, where we, Department of Sanitation collects it. They deliver it to us in those white collection trucks that you see on the street all the time. And from that point on, we own the material and we're responsible for moving it and processing it and selling it. Uh, and so in the Bronx, we receive material from trucks, collection trucks in the Bronx in northern Manhattan. We put that material uh, into barges. Same thing in Queens. Actually, in Queens, we're located right across from the uh, sewage treatment plant, which we're going to be hearing about. Um, in the Bronx, sort of talking about kind of collaboration or, or um, uh, compatibility of, of of uh, recreational and industrial uses. In the Bronx, our direct neighbor is a little organization called Rocking the Boat, where they take kids from uh, really sort of a very underserved community in the Bronx and have after school programs. They build wooden boats. We launch their boats for them. We have cookout with them. It's a fantastic relationship. It makes us be very careful, makes us, held, holds us, I should say, to a very high standard in terms of, of keeping a clean operation. But we can. We can load scrap metal into barges, load flattened metal, flattened automobiles into barges next door to where kids are launching wooden boats they've made. Um, and Newtown Creek is a much more industrial setting, but increasingly there's more and more recreational boaters on the on the creek, and so that's really that that's what we have to be able to we have to be able to uh, function in that environment. Um, but anyway, going back to the marine aspect. We then barge material from those locations to our facility in Jersey. I mean, in, in, well, in Jersey we have a facility as well, but here in uh, Brooklyn, we unload that material and we process it. We sort it into a dozen or so commodities and then we ship those commodities out. Uh, glass and metal goes out by barge to our facility in Jersey. Uh, some metal products, other metal products are, are go out by rail. I think we're one of the main users actually now of the rail the newly refurbished rail on the Brooklyn waterfront, and then some commodities go out by truck. 
Um, there's other things we built into this facility. We had the largest photovoltaic system on the site. I think there's since been a larger one, went up in the Bronx. Uh, and we did a muscle cultivation program. And the city built three reeves out there uh, as an offset to the dredging, which are actually now very healthy, uh, thriving marine habitat right off the end of the pier. Um, so we've also built an education center there. Coming back to the theme of education, uh, and uh, the basic premise that if New Yorkers aren't enthusiastic, willing participants in the recycling program, um, you know, I can have this big fancy facility, but we're just going to be sitting around looking at a lot of expensive equipment. So, um, and then uh, the economic development aspect. I mean, I think we are very proud to be part of a legitimate working waterfront. We do use that waterfront. That's how materials come and go. And we are a real uh, employer of really, I would call blue collar, if you will, jobs. Uh, we've, we're up to about, I think, 60 people now, primarily from the Brooklyn community, people from Bronx as well, though. Everything from laborers to forklift operators, crane operators, scale operators, supervisors. Um, that's part of, that's uh, part of, I think, what, what uh, drew this, or uh, d caused the city to identify this pier and, and try and have us set this up in the city as opposed to building our operations in Jersey. Um, I'll just leave it yeah, there. great, thank you. And I think um, in, in true fashion as a, as a maritime industrial rep, Thomas is being modest. Uh, I think that in a lot of ways, Sims really represents the, the, the best example of a company that is in a, in quite frankly, a, you know, a gritty uh, maritime industrial business moving waste goods. Um, you know, it's, there's heavy equipment, trucks coming and going, but they designed public access right into their uh, thinking from the beginning. You know, places for school groups to come in, places for buses to stage and turn around, places for people to observe the process. And so people are really welcome to the Sims facility. You can't just walk onto their pier, you know, you can't just go hang out. But in a structured way, much like the Newtown Creek plant, you can very much go and smell, see, uh, not touch, I guess, but um, <laughs> experience the, the recycling transfer process up close and personal. Um, I'm going to use my prerogative as moderator here and um, uh, point out, uh, well, here's where at the passenger, uh, the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal, um, an adaptive reuse of old Port Authority piers. But I'd also like to point out the um, oil tanker, the historic oil tanker Mary Whalen is coming up and Carolina Selguero is here. You want to raise your hand from port side? I uh, encourage everyone to talk to Carolina about the plight of the historic oil tanker, the Mary Whalen. You can see her up, uh, well, you can see Carolina here, but you can see the Mary Whalen up at um, Pier 9B, it, she, that, that gorgeous looking boat with the, with the, with the long lines, a uh, historic oil tanker, which uh, Carolina and Portside are transforming into a floating maritime educational experience for the public to come and learn about how uh, goods have moved by water in this harbor for many centuries and hopefully many centuries to come. So. There's the Mary Whalen. Okay, last but definitely not least, Jim Pinn from DEP. Thank you. Hello, thank you everyone. So as in my introduction was said, I'm the plant superintendent. I'm the chief operator of a wastewater treatment plant. So what am I doing here with you guys? I gotta give you a little history about New York City to so understand where we are right this moment. Uh, the Newtown Creek plant is the largest of the city's 14 treatment plants. 1.3 billion gallons a day is treated and returned into the waters we're sailing on right now. We have a really important part. For over 120 some odd years, we've been treating wastewater to some degree. Newtown Creek was the last of the city's plants to come into the Clean Water Act standards, which means 85% of the pollutant load coming in has to be removed. We started the facility plan in 1992. It took five years. The facility plan led us to, I guess, why I'm here today. We wanted to make the place accessible. Accessible to two ways. One, we were the first group in Greenpoint to allow the community to get to their water that surround the community. We built a nature walk access on the back end of the plant that allows the community a daily respite to come and be within the Newtown Creek waters. Has a little bit of a stigma right now that it's a super fun site, but it's gonna get cleaned up. And the first third of a mile coming in where we reside is really not that bad. There's a lot of wildlife present. The second thing we did is we realized that we wanted to make the industrial works of a treatment plant accessible to people. People wanted to know, so we built the visitor's center. And the visitor's center is an attachment to the plant which not only talks about wastewater, but all of the department's goals. 
We deal with asbestos remediation, lead remediation, our water supply that comes from upstate New York, one of the finest in the world, and also how the works involved the systems, the infrastructure that's built into the sidewalks that we take for granted. The best part of my job is, in, is informing most of you, whoever want to show up, and the best of those are the children and the kids. They're our ambassadors. They're the ones that take home every little word that, and they, they hang on it when they get home and they beat the heck out of mommy and daddy about running the water, shaving excessively, using too much uh, water in the backyard. So we're, we're able to take these folks at a very young age and they're able to bring them into a, into a very technical facility. But with a sixth grade science level of education, you can explain and understand everything I do. Believe it or not, I'm not giving away any secrets. The other part of the job is the fact that the general public on, a, on the second Tuesday of every month is invited in. A lot of misconceptions about what goes on in a wastewater treatment plant. But by the time they finish the, about an hour or so with me, they're pretty well scored on how things work and what the fact goes on in there. A lot of folks think that we're taking their wastewater and making it into drinking water. What a mistake that is. But in fact, most of the country does just that. Take wastewater, turn it back into drinking water. Most of the country, the astronauts didn't do it. When I was a kid, we introduced tang into our vocabulary. And the reason the astronauts drank the water with tang is to kill the case. Because it was basically the urine they were recycling through, this, through the uh, space trip. All right, TMI call here. All right. <laughs> So one of, the things, one of the things I do best is trying to relate what wastewater treatment like is to a daily experience in your home. How your waste goes down. Sewage is not a dirty word in, in my vocabulary. And by the time they leave, I implore them at dinner table the next, that night when they go home is discuss wastewater. Because we talk about the consistencies of things like 2.5% as being pea soup and 6 or 7% as being a nice Italian gravy that you put on top of macaroni. Now I'm not trying to gross anybody out. But when you think of things in the way that you deal with life on a daily basis, you remember them. So most people go out skipping, applauding, and having a good time about wastewater. Now, I'm not here to talk about how good I am as an instructor. I wouldn't dare say the word educator. But one of the things I do say is I ask how many kids like math and science when they enter into the classroom. Not many hands go up. But by the time we get through to te te teaching them about what I do as an engineer and about all the jobs that are in my facility, similar to the other gentlemen speaking, there is an interest and a fact that there's a spark that they want to start learning about math and science because it is a career plan. I tell them I put three kids in college, I've lived in Brooklyn my whole life, and I enjoy what I do. And if you enjoy what you do, life is not a bad thing. So um, I'm here to try to add my bit about what government is trying to do to make the waterfront access applicable to the community and also to open our doors to a very, very important industry so people can not only understand what we do but learn from it and hopefully get a couple of people to replace me because I'm in my 40th year and I gotta retire soon. Please, do. Jim, can you say a word about how DEP uses the water? Okay, so the waterways. Wastewater, wastewater in the city um, is fishable, swimmable quality. All the wastewater treatment plants are built on the waterfront because we gotta get your waste back into a receiving water, in this case, the Hudson, Jamaica Bay, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, almost all of the wastewater in the plant is, is uh, sent right back into the receiving waters, fishable, swimmable, brackish water around New York. One of the things I do want to tell you about is the methane gas. If you know anything about wastewater treatment, your sludge, your solids are changed into methane gas in which we use to power the plant in form of energy for either boilers or engines. And we're taking on a new project where over a million children a day have two meals a day in the city school system and that one bite of the bologna sandwich or peanut butter sandwich, most of it goes in the trash. We're collecting that trash, source separating it, waste management. We're gonna make additional methane gas in our digesters and we're collaborating with uh, National Grid. We're gonna be selling the extra methane gas that I can no, lo, not consume and we're gonna have revenue over it. So wastewater treatment plants are becoming resource recovery plants. And uh, I implore anyone who wants a second career to look into the environment as far as wastewater treatment. I think you'll. You'll, you'll be really satisfied with that career. And again, it makes a great date, the wastewater treatment plant. Check out op Open House New York, and also DP has tours pretty regularly, right? Of the, 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 of second thurs the second Tuesday of every month, and uh, just to pick up on uh, what our host said, is uh, we've had three Valentine's Day tours, one, one uh, Halloween Day tour, and if it wasn't for me going to Mexico last week, we were going to have an egg tour um, around the Easter time, but I told them I already had a plan, so... That got scrapped. 
You will, I'm not kidding, you will laugh, you will cry. It is an awesome, awesome tour. Thank you. Um, so I think we're gonna, we're gonna take questions from the audience, is that right? Do we have the cards or are we just taking hands or we're just taking hands? I'll just say, um, you know, we've been passing the, the Red Hook uh, container terminal. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I love seeing, I love seeing the harbor from the water as I sh I'm sure you all do too because we're all just preaching to the choir here at the MWA conference. But I think that um, one of the interesting tensions, again, between public access and, you know, you can't get into this facility, uh, well, ca other, unless you're Carolina. Um, but, you know, people want, p people want access to the waterfront everywhere, but ironically, it's pushing out the maritime businesses. And I often think of Jane Jacobs in, in general, but I think about great st stories she tells about going down to the Hudson River and how she just loves to bring a sandwich and sit and watch the tugboats coming and going and all the great activity. And, you know, you go down to the Hudson River today, and as much as I love the park, it's kind of boring. I mean, it, you know, th there's, no, there's nothing, there's no activity, there's nothing to see, there's nothing to really kind of sink your teeth into, and in, 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 it's, it's a very sort of polished aluminum world. Um, and I think the grittiness of the working waterfront and, the, and the, the vitality and the things coming and going and the people doing their jobs are so uh, in, intrinsic to what makes New York, New York, but how do, you, how do you get people safely there to see it? So there's always this tension, there's always this irony that we, we want to clean up our waterfront and make it accessible to everyone, but then we end up with a very sort of sterile waterfront. So um, with that proselytizing, I will read you some questions. Um, uh, okay, how can we balance the desire for public access, who read, who read my mind? How can we balance the desire for public access against the needs for industrial development and recognize how important a role industrial uh, waterfront uses are to the city's infrastructure overall? Do I have any takers on the panel for that one? In your minds, how can we balance this desire? Can I, can I Do we need coffee? The, well, the only Dutchman on the panel, maybe. Yeah. I think we heard some good examples here already today. Um, you find a balance if you look for uh, re redeveloping your waterfront by looking at the waterfront activities that there used to be in the past and put them in a new, modern, sustainable perspective. Because in that sense, you develop again a working waterfront, just as you just described it, where you f try to find this mix of uh, yeah, working, accessibility, recreation, etc., creating sound uh, economic uh, possibilities, but at the same time uh, make it accessible. And it is more accessible um, than a normal park when people are also somehow connected to it and involved in it. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the idea, I think, behind the, the sterility of the park you just mentioned. If it's just a nice park, but nobody is really involved in it or connected to it, then it could become boring. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Just to add to that, I think, um, you know, instead of having a, a sort of romantic notion about what we'd like the waterfront to be, like it was in the 50s or the 40s, really focus on what it can be now and the quality, not only of the recreational experience, but of the jobs, and why those jobs are important to New York City. And you know, study after study has shown these jobs pay 25, 40% more than service sector jobs. If we're serious about having more income equity in the city, more pathways up the economic ladder, more pathways into the middle class, the focus has to be on these kinds of industrial jobs, whether they're maritime related or not. Uh, I think also there's been a lot of positive focus on the successes at the Brooklyn Army Terminal and at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and I think you know that's a model that can be looked at for other publicly owned waterfront sites. And you know, in obviously a, a self-interested plug, I think looking at where the private sector is catching on um, and supporting that in ways that make sense for government. So. One of the big differences between the success around the Navy Yard and Dumbo and downtown Brooklyn and a little bit more limited success down in the Sunset Park area is basic public infrastructure. So you look at any place where the roads, the water, the stormwater runoff, the bulkheads have been rebuilt, you're usually finding a success story. Where they've been allowed to decay for 100 years, it's a lot harder. I think 
piggybacking on what the two gentlemen said, in order for any type of infrastructure development to occur, you need to make sure that the education system is part of the process, which means that along with the Common Core Curriculum Learning Standards, you need to make sure that whether it's elementary, middle school, and particularly in high school, that's where the students need to see and me be reminded of and be exposed to and be mentored and have job shadowing opportunities to be able to see the connection with what they're studying in class and how it can lead to that particular career. Because there is a difference between a job and a career. And for our young men, whatever the color that they are, whatever their uh, religious persuasion, every single young man and young woman, by the way, that's a whole separate topic about young women, they need to get involved in the maritime industry. But the particular piece that I want to uh, make a connection to is the fact that with infrastructure, students have a vague idea in terms of what path they have to take to get there. Through career and technical education uh, process, which I hope you had a chance to be able to look at the brochure uh, that was distributed, I hope you see that that path has to not only be clearly laid out, it has to be modeled, it has to be nurtured, it has to be supported, and they have to see the connections and the links established between the school and the business community. Thank you, that's a great point. Um, and again, we're passing now Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, which was former Port Authority working waterfront and um, now gives the public the access that they so desire. But again, where's the working waterfront gone? And um, it's now in the, in the piers to the south. But I know, you know, when we, <laughs> when we were at EDC, I mean, it's, we, we kind of continually draw the line in the sand and then it gets moved back and you draw the, draw the line in the sand. And I think we really need to just fight. Um, you know, I would say we need sort of like industrial conservation. It's almost like an oxymoron, but we really need to make sure that, you know, having an inland port facility like the Red Hook Container Terminal is so essential. And it's becoming more and more rare in big cities around the world to have your marine distribution located right next to your consumers. So I'm sure in the next 15 years, we'll see another golden waterfront development plan for Red Hook and more condos. And I really hope everyone in this room helps put, put your foot down to, to save the working waterfront. But again, it needs to be a waterfront that is accessible and um, makes room for the public like, like, like several of our panelists have. And I'm gonna continue to use my prerogative as moderator to plug the, the Working Harbor Committee Many of you may have heard of the Working Harbor Committee, and uh, John Doswell is over here. Um, but the Hidden Harbor Tours uh, are starting again in June. This is a great opportunity. They really go up into the nooks and crannies of the Newtown Creek. Um, you can actually see the dead water. Um, you go into the right by the port facilities in Newark. Uh, you really see a side of the harbor that most people never see, and there's usually great narrators. I myself have even been a narrator. Um, no, but no, they really are great narrators from the, from the maritime industry who really um, give you the facts. And then I have to plug for the Working Harbor Committee um, an event Tuesday, May 6, Getting It Up, the fascinating story of marine salvage. So um, check out the, the, uh, um, the um, Working Harbor Committee's website. Every, uh, every, all the dates will be included. Last question um, for Jim Penn and Tom Outerbridge. Tell us more about how you interacted with and used the skills of experienced and sophisticated architects, Aeneid in the case of the Newtown Creek and uh, Seldorf Architects in the case of Sims. And I would just ask that maybe if you could focus on how working with those great architectural firms, you know, how you integrated uh, public access into your thinking about the design of these facilities. Um, I guess in the case of our facility, uh, Seldorf Architects was actually not known for recycling facilities. I don't think there's any architectural firm actually that's known for its <laughs> recycling plants. But um, the reason we actually selected them was um, uh, because they were known for simplicity in their design, very sort of clean, simple facilities, and, um, and a real, we, in the selection process, we laid out uh, 
some pretty stringent budget limitations um, because it is a recycling plant, not a condominium complex. We have a strict budget um, and actually they embrace the notion of actually trying to uh, work within the limitations, particularly taking pre-engineered metal building systems and sitting with those engineers and seeing what, uh, how far you could push the envelope uh, without it becoming an extraordinarily custom building with high cost. So, so that was um, the basis for selecting them and, and, and um, working with, through with them really all of the, the details of our operation and, 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 and they basically applying their very sort of minimalist approach, asking why getting rid of anything that's not necessary which is fantastic from my standpoint because it's not just a budgetary thing, it's a maintenance item. We, I, we operate for two shifts and, and do cleanup and maintenance for one shift. It's a, very much part of what we do. So the f I don't want the fewer things jutting out or this and that. Um, we avoid the higgledy-piggledy aspect of <laughs> things is, is uh, <coughs> makes for a good operation. And then, and then the other thing that we're very good at um, and we didn't know this when we selected them, but a lot of the, the, the discussion was about, um, as Venetia said, public access and how to allow people onto the site uh, and not have them cross crossing lanes of sanitation drivers speeding through the yard or uh, f forklifts or cranes and front end loaders operating. So they, <coughs> I think, have spent enough time in that world of designing museums and galleries and understanding people flow and um, our deliveries and so on to to step back and really think about a site plan that made that that created a safe environment, but also actually took advantage of the location and putting uh, the original uh, engineers really wanted to put our education center right at the entrance because that way we could minimize people traveling through the site, and that was kind of a non-starter because you lose the whole advantage of being on a pier. So actually, our visitor center is right at the very end of the pier. Um, uh, where actually you end up with the best views of the harbor. So, so maybe a more, more pointed question for Jim. I don't, were you involved in the, the design of the facility from the, given what you know about the importance of public education um, and, and, and how did that factor in when you were working with Aeneid and the sort of sophisticated design team for the Newtown Creek eggs? Okay, great. So Aeneon was formerly known as Jim Polshek and Partners. You may know Jim Polshek because he designed the um, Museum of Natural History in the Hayden Planetarium, that connection. And also, if you're in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Museum down by Grand Army Plaza, the whole front facade is Jim Polshek and company. So we hired a, a, a company in order to flaunt the largeness of this facility. We couldn't hide it, so we're going to flaunt it. The second thing you have to remember, it's a 15-year stage construction. Multiple bid, low bids, municipal contracts, Wix Law, four primes. In order to do that, you have to have a consistency, what we consider to hold the kit of parts, where we were going to make it seamless over the 15-year construction. So we pre-purchased all the brick. We had standards of materials. We used a lot of stainless steel for sustainability. And all that put together. And we did have a vo very large voice in how we wanted the layout of the facility to be, not only for function, but for form. Uh, the two words that I learned being around architects. The, um, the Visitor Center was a percent for art program. Department of Cultural Affairs determines that a percentage of every city's capital program has to be percent for art. So George Tarakas designed the uh, nature walk in the back, and Vito Acconci designed the fountains and the Visitor Center up front. And the public had a choice of how it was going to look and what it was going to look like. We invited them in early. So it was a good collaboration between the neighborhood, our designers, our architects, and our need to meet treatment. We can't forget we're a wastewater treatment plant. Thank you. And then um, maybe maybe this is a fitting conclusion over here at Pier 17 about how New York's waterfront continues to eat itself. Um, but we're also passing the historic um, lightship Ambrose, Peking, the Waver Tree. Uh, another plug this Saturday, the South Street Seaport Museum has a, um, an open tour of all its boats. Bound printers will be there as the museum um, struggles to stay afloat um, uh, at South Street. Kent, when are, Kent, when are you talking about um, South Street? In the next session, uh, I would encourage everyone to go and hear about the, the future of South Street Seaport. I think it's a really important topic, and we're passing the historic Fulton Fish Market 
There's the new market building from the back. Okay, um, yeah, Roland, do you have public announcements? Thank you. <laughs>